Thank you for joining. My name is Sharma Podila. I'm a software engineer in the edge engineering part of Netflix. And today we're going to look at how we are doing uh, scheduling of resources from a heterogeneous mix of hosts to a heterogeneous mix of tasks, service, batch style. We do stream processing as well. And how do we do that in a cloud native um, environment? Because Netflix primarily runs on Amazon EC2. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, well, what motivated us to look at Mesos? Why are we doing what we're doing? Uh, what are the problems? And then uh, dive into a little bit about a scheduling library called Fenzo. I'm going to go into the details of how it's useful for a framework to do a lot of the scheduling. And I'm going to share with you some of the results we have so far and where we're going with it next. So one of the first questions uh, we got asked, we, we started looking at Apache Mesos about 18 months ago, is if we are using an elastic cloud already, why do you need to schedule resources using Mesos? So there's two reasons that motivated us. One is resource granularity. Uh, granted, you've got different instance types in a cloud like EC2, but still, when you pick an instance type that is appropriate, say, for network-intensive workloads, you end up getting also more CPUs and memory th than you might use. So we can then pack other tasks onto it, bin packing, et cetera. And another one is to start up an instance, it takes a few minutes, uh, versus I can literally start the task using Mesos in a few milliseconds. So those are two good enough reasons for us to start looking at Mesos. So, like I said, about 18 months ago, we started working on a stream processing system in which we were trying to do a lot more intelligent scheduling of individual uh, components of a stream topology and trying to do that for a lot of stream processing jobs. And then around the same time, there was another team that was building a framework for container management, a Docker-based container management, um, deploying applications, et cetera. So when we look at the stream processing system, um, of course, we wanted it to be cloud native. And what it means to us is that we see a large variation in the amount of data to process across a day. Uh, the number of resources needed sometimes could be 5x difference between peak and trough. So we definitely want to be auto scaling. And in our stream processing system, the jobs are very lightweight. There are going to be service style always perpetually running stream processing jobs, doing anomaly detection, et cetera. But there's also stream processing jobs that are very lightweight where users react to an anomaly in an operations environment and then want to dig into, hey, what else is going on? So these are transient, short-running stream processing jobs looking at a specific aspect. So, so we have all kinds of tasks being uh, submitted into the framework. And then we have cloud constructs. If you're familiar with Amazon EC2, each region has multiple zones, and a zone is approximately a data center, and in order for us to be resilient, we deploy each job as multiple tasks across zones, so to be able to balance that, and there were other resource utilization constraints as well that the jobs have. Uh, a stream processing job is a, a set of stages. Think of it as, for example, a map, reduce, collect kind of a stage. So there's multiple stages, and each stage is one or more workers, and each worker is a task that we schedule using Mesos. And when we look at container management, um, there's the usual applications that run as services, but we also look, uh, we are looking at batch applications that are run uh, using the containers as well. And again, a job can have multiple sets of containers. Uh, most of the jobs have one set of tasks. That's fine, so schedule each of them. They're gonna be assigned a resource and they're gonna run. But sometimes we also have jobs that have multiple sets of tasks and we have constraints across them to say, make sure that a task from set zero and task from set one run together on the same host. And this is where you've got an application that needs sort of a sidecar to run along with it but you want to have resource isolation across them. So they have to be two different tasks that are co-located. So these were sort of the use cases that were brewing up when we started. And then the question was, well, there are frameworks in the 
community that we could use? Why do we have to develop our own? Is it because is, it's easy to write a new framework? If you actually look at the interface that Mesos provides, the scheduler interface, it's pretty simple. I mean, you can actually write some Java code in half a day and have tasks running. It's a relatively simple interface that they provide. But when you start thinking about how well is your framework going to scale? Is it going to be highly performant? Um, well, fault tolerance, and that's a big aspect of any distributed system. And is it going to be highly available? Very soon, writing a new framework becomes daunting. And not to forget, scheduling itself is a hard problem to solve. So why did we decide to write one? Well, we concluded that we really need a long-term justification before we embark on a new framework. Otherwise, it's far easier to use an existing one. Or if you see some aspects that are missing for you in that, work with the community, do a pull request. That's far easier than writing an entire new framework. So what are our motivations? One was cloud native. Um, again, I talked about auto scaling. But also important is being cloud native while doing a lot of the scheduling optimizations. So we're going to have a mix of service, batch, and stream processing topologies. And each of them will have multiple constraints uh, in how to place the tasks, data locality, and in stream processing, what we call stream locality. Similar to data locality, where uh, two stream processing jobs that are reading data from the same source can be co-located, so the network bandwidth can be optimized. So things like that. How do we achieve all these while doing the auto scaling? So these were some of the motivations that led us to write our own framework. So why is auto scaling a challenge? Um, when you really think about it, scaling up is relatively easy. You can, for example, monitor the resources available uh, for new tasks. And when it falls below a threshold, you just add more instances, right? That's relatively simple. But it's scaled down that is a little bit more challenging. So suppose I have a, a simple cluster of four hosts here, and I have approximately 50% utilization going on. I could have placed tasks on every machine using half the resources, or I could have placed tasks only on half the machines. And if I did the latter, it's easy for me to terminate the idle host and achieve scale down. If you've got jobs, tasks that are long running and stateful, it's not easy to terminate them from, uh, terminate the hosts that are running the tasks and migrate them. Um, so that's why it's important for us to assign them such that I bin pack them and free as many resources as possible. And it turns out this is actually useful even in a data center because when you bin pack them and leave more machines idle, you're going to use less power in the data center. So it's useful there as well. So since we had two frameworks being developed, we wanted to see, do we need to really write two different ones for these? And when we look at a framework, um, well, there's like three parts to it, really, at least from my perspective. There's the API. Every framework presents an API to its user. Um, some frameworks are focused on running containers. Some frameworks are focused on running stream topologies. This, so there's an API that they uh, provide. And, and for us, the API is going to be different. It's difficult to come up with one API that would be acceptable to every framework. All right? So that's going to be different. Then there is the need for a framework to be connected into Mesos, uh, through the driver, to the task reconciliation, all of that. And, and in the beginning, it looks like, hey, this is pretty common. Everybody needs to do the same thing. However, a part of task reconciliation and state updates is persistence. And it turns out frameworks try to do different kinds of persistence. Some of them use the log replication available in Mesos itself. Some of them are using Cassandra or, or, or other databases. Uh, but basically, the persistence can make frameworks do different kinds of interaction or a different style of interaction with Mesos. And a third component is the actual assignments itself. And what we've determined is that hey, this actually is looking like it could be pretty common because at the end of the day, a framework gets resource offers and then it assigns resources to the tasks that are pending. So we decided, hey, let's develop a library that can be used by both of those frameworks. So we developed a, this scheduling library called Fenso 
And the way it looks in the um, overall structure is that you've got a framework that gets the offers, gets the task. It feeds both of these, the set of tasks that are pending, the set of offers that you receive from ASOS into Fenzo. Along with that, you give it some objectives. Hey, here's what I want to do, achieve in my scheduling. I want to do bin packing, or I want to do some other objectives, task locality, et cetera. Given all these, Fenzo comes up with assignments. And then those can be used by the framework to call Mesos driver to launch the task on those hosts. So what does Fenzo have? It supports heterogeneous mix of tasks, like I said, heterogeneous resources. Uh, it provides a way to auto scale the execution cluster. Uh, how many instances you're gonna have in the cluster, how many execution hosts or the agents. Uh, it provides visibility into not only where the tasks are being assigned, but also if the task is not able to get resources, it provides you visibility into what's failing. Is it because it's asking for some number of CPUs that can be satisfied, memory, network bandwidth, et cetera. And another thing we learned is that some of the customization we want to do in scheduling, we can't think of everything in the beginning. And, and sometimes it's hard to keep adding one scheduling feature at a time because by the end of it, it becomes so complex, you're sometimes just adding, putting Band-Aids on top of, hey, we lack this feature, now let's add this feature. So what we've finalized is that we're gonna provide a way to customize scheduling as we go by providing the support for plugins. So you can provide plugins, I'm gonna talk about how that works. And it, it's, fast doing all this. I mean, speed is very important as well. And I'm going to show you some experiments where we did for speed. And with that, it gives me great pleasure, actually, to announce that we're going to make Fenzo available in the open source. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we, um, we have seen Fenzo being used in two frameworks within uh, Netflix, but we believe that it can be used by any framework. As, as long as they're using Java because it's a Java library. And the rest of my talk, I'm gonna talk about what is Fenzo, how can it be useful for your frameworks. Whether you develop a framework or you're using a framework, you can probably um, benefit from what Fenzo can provide you. So when you think about scheduling, uh, we look at tasks and hosts that have resources, and there's two, dimensions to it. One is called urgency, how urgent is a task, or how well does a task fit on a specific host. And if either the urgency or fitness is very high, we go ahead and assign it, otherwise we keep looking. So that's sort of the strategy, right? But scheduling can be computationally expensive um, if we use a first fit kind of a strategy, which a lot of the frameworks do these days. It's pretty fast. However, if you want to calculate the most optimal assignment, it could be pretty expensive even if you're not reassigning running tasks. So ideally what we want to do is stay in the middle somewhere, hopefully to the left end of the spectrum so we are fast, but achieve as much as possible the optimal assignments. So how do we do that? It's pretty simple. For each task, we start looking at the hosts, and as long as the constraints are met, and I'm going to talk about what a constraint is, we evaluate the fitness to say how well does this task fit on this host. So when you're assigning resources to a task, it is possible that it can actually run on host A or host B or host C, how do you pick which one? So we calculate a fitness, we're scoring the host to say which one do I pick. But we're not gonna do score that on every host possible. We're only gonna do it until we get a fitness score that's good enough. So it's a very simple strategy, but the sophistication comes in two things. One is defining what is a good enough fitness so it stops calculating unnecessarily for too long. And the other sophistication comes in the form of fitness calculator and the constraints, which are all plugins. So you're gonna talk, look at how that works. So constraints could be a hard constraint where a constraint must be met before the host can be selected for that task. Or it could be a soft constraint where it's a best effort basis. So the task is saying, hey, I would rather run on a resource that meets this constraint, but if you're not able to find any, run, run me anywhere on a host that you can find right now. So it's a soft constraint. And they're extensible, you can write your own plugins. So there are some built-in constraints that we have in Fenzo. 
Um, and they could also act as examples for you to write your own plugins. And uh, these, uh, these are addressing the use cases we have right now. One of them is host attribute value constraint. Uh, for example, a task says I can only run on instance type of say R3. R3 is a class of instance types in Amazon. And then the task basically puts in a constraint saying, uh, I need to have instance type equal to R3. And then that's all it needs to do and then it'll be placed on the right instance. Another constraint is unique host attribute constraint. Uh, if you have a set of tasks, you wanna make sure they run on different machines where they have different values for that attribute. For example, in, in Amazon Cloud, we have zones, or in a data center, you have racks. If you have, like, say, three tasks that need to run on different racks, you, you put in a constraint saying, I need unique value of the rack location for these three tasks, and it'll just place them accordingly. So that's another constraint. Now, and this can work in, as, a, as a, a soft constraint as well. So, for example, I've got three zones but we have an outage in zone three. And if I had a soft constraint, then, then um, when all the zones are up, the task would be distributed across all three zones. If one zone has an outage, then the task would be distributed across two zones. If it's a soft constraint, because it wasn't able to find it, so it'll do the best effort basis and then launch it on a, a zone that's available. Or if it was a hard constraint, then it'll actually sit there waiting for that zone to come back up. Then. There's another constraint called a balance host attribute where we're not necessarily looking for unique values, but we're trying to balance them across. I've got a job of, ten, say, nine tasks, and I need to make sure they're balanced across the data center racks or balanced across uh, zones in Amazon EC2. Then, giving this constraint, it'll automatically balance them across. So I'm gonna move into fitness evaluator. Um, so what fitness evaluation does, it gives you a, a degree of fitness. Um, maybe on a host, depending on what else it's running, a task may fit okay. On another host, depending on what it is running currently, it may fit very well. And that may depend on the host type. It may depend on other tasks that are running for data locality and things like that. So fitness evaluation um, is used for that. And there could be different fitness calculators. Um, bin packing is, is one fitness calculator that I'm gonna talk about. And there could be another fitness calculator that says, hey, I wanna make sure that uh, a, a host is primarily only running service jobs or primarily only running batch jobs because batch jobs complete on a finite time and I can easily shut those machines down, whereas service jobs tend to run forever. So then I can have both these fitness calculators the bin packing as well as the task type packing, and then compose them together to say both are important. It's not that I want to just do this or just do that, but I could give weights to them to say one is more important than the other. So let's look at how bin packing works. So if I've got five hosts, and each of these are four core, CPU, uh, four core machines, and then if I'm assigning resources to a single CPU task, then, um, well, I assign a score by using a very simple equation saying, it's the ratio between the used CPUs that's including the task that's being assigned over the total CPUs, and that's 0 0.25 for host one because that will be the only task running there, etc. For host four, it's 1.0. Host five doesn't fit it; it's already full. So I just pick the one with the highest score. So that basically just having this simple equation in the fitness calculator achieves bin packing. And I'm going to show you some experiment results how bin, how effective the bin packing works. Oh, this, this is a, a way to combine different fitness calculators giving different weights. So in this, what we're saying, and we use this in our system, bin packing is important, but so is the packing based on the runtime types. And we can say one is more important than the other, et cetera. So the other part of this was auto scaling. Um, so Fenzo has a concept of having different host groups. So for example, you can have hosts that are are primarily tuned for compute workload, other hosts that are primarily tuned for memory intensive or network intensive workloads. And for each of them, you can specify, I wanna make sure that there are at least some number of idle hosts in my cluster. So if there's a new task, it doesn't have to wait for the instance to spin up, a new instance to spin up. 
And then I also want to make sure I don't um, reduce my utilization by having too many of them. And then you can give a maximum idle. So given these, what Fenzer does is that it, it bin packs them to as few machines as possible. But if it's still falling short, it gives a callback into the framework. You need to add exactly this number, uh, this number of hosts into the system. Or if there is more than necessary, then it gives you a list of host names that you can terminate or, or remove from the cluster. So you can give it back into the cloud and not be charged for it. So that's how auto scaling works. And in such an uh, auto scaling environment, normally you do have a cool down period when you scale up. You don't want to scale up again before those new instances come up. So there's a cool down period, which is pretty common. However, what could happen is you could have a sudden influx of new workload during that cool down period. And if you were to wait for that cool down before you scale up, you'll still be short again. So Fenzo does a resource shortfall analysis. Um, and what it does is looking at the task, how many resources would I actually need? And then it scales up aggressively, even if it's in the cooldown period. And then later, if the resources when are, are not necessary, then it can scale down. So that's how that works. So I'm gonna share a few results that, um, that we've seen at Netflix. First of all, for auto scaling, um, this is across few days, I think it's about five days or six days. And this is showing the number of hosts in the cluster. Um, I don't have the actual numbers for you, but this is about 3x difference in the peak and trough. So we, we scale up and down the cluster based on the actual demand. And sometimes it's time of the day, but sometimes it's also because there's more activity based on what's happening in, in the services. And the other part of it is, well, how fast are we scheduling? And it turns out scheduling is pretty quick. Um, it's just a few milliseconds to figure out an assignment. Um, we do use bin packing, like I showed you before, a couple of criteria, a couple of criteria to do bin packing, and a few constraints as well. The actual scheduling time will depend on the number of tasks you have to assign, the number of hosts across which to figure out assignments. Uh, what kind of constraints you have and things like that, but generally it is pretty fast. So Fenzo is a scheduler library, so to experiment with it, you don't really need an entire cluster. So I could, for example, come up with a new fitness calculator that's going to affect how fast scheduling happens, but I can experiment with it without having to spin up a cluster. Um, you can mock a resource object and give it into Fenzo. And Fenzo doesn't depend on the Mesos code itself. It has a representation of the offer. So you can mock those offers and then you can give in task requests and then you can easily write new fitness calculators and see if you're going to affect your scheduling time. So we did a couple of experiments. One was, okay, let's see how well the bin packing works. So we've got 3000 hosts, each of eight cores. Uh, we've got three different task types. Some tasks ask for just single CPU. Well, bin packing single CPU tasks is easy, right? I mean, you just keep assigning them, they'll get packed pretty well. But we also have tasks that are asking for three CPUs and other tasks asking for six. Now, if you try to assign them incorrectly, then you can't really pack them well. So first we ran it without bin packing. So what this is showing is that some, num some number of hosts were fully utilized, all eight cores were assigned some number of hosts had partial resources assigned and some were empty. And then we used the bin packing. What it shows is, is more number of hosts were fully packed, very few hosts were partially packed, and there's more number of hosts that are idle. So this is how bin packing helps. Well, again, with that simple equation. And bin packing can be done not only based on CPU usage, um, like I said, runtime. So we did another experiment to say, hey, let's see how that would work. And it's actually even better. Um, without the bin packer for based on task runtime, you've got some, ta some hosts running long running tasks versus short, whereas using the bin packer, every host had either, one, either the long running task or all short running tasks. So that helps as well. So the other part of the, the other experiment was sort of speed. 
Um, so again, in this, we have eight CPU hosts. Um, and the way we mixed them up was we were going to start with an empty cluster and fill the entire cluster. And when we fill it, we, we have tasks such that 20% of the CPUs in the entire cluster will be occupied by a single CPU task, 40% by four CPU tasks, and 40% by six CPU tasks. Now, how fast can we fill the entire cluster? So first, we had 1,000 hosts. And when you call Fenzo to assign one task at a time, the scheduling took on an average three milliseconds. Um, so if you're calling Fenzo to assign one task at a time, then it took about nine seconds to fill the entire cluster. But if I were to call Fenzo for 200 tasks at a time, so you, so you can batch, batch up a few tasks and, and call Fenzo once for the 200 tasks, the average time is 40 milliseconds, but obviously that's for all of the 200 tasks. And it took less than a second to fill up the entire cluster. So every time you call Fenzo, there is some housekeeping done. So that's why it's, it's far more efficient to call the scheduling routine with more tasks. And this is not uncommon when people submit. They're not necessarily submitting one task. They're submitting a job, which is multiple tasks. And it, so it fits very well with a lot of the usage models. And so what, what happens when I increase the number of hosts? So what if I had 10,000 hosts? Uh, doing it one task at a time took under 30 milliseconds, but it takes a very long time to fill 80,000 CPUs. It took almost 900 seconds. But again, when I do that with 200 tasks at a time, it just took 19 seconds to fill the entire cluster. Now, this is not a benchmark. Um, I don't want to claim this is a real benchmark. Um, to do a real benchmark, it, it's beyond my expertise to set up machines to, to, to exactly measure. This is a simple program that does system dot get current millis, current time millis, and then does the scheduling routine and then measures the time later. So a very simple routine. Um, but again, the point here is that it allows you to write customization and test them before you actually put it into production, and that's pretty useful. So um, Fenzo is available on Netflix GitHub. Um, if you're going to go access it right now, you'll have to give me a few minutes. Um, I don't have a colleague here with me here, so I'll have to finish my talk and then go open up the gate. But it will be available today, a few minutes later. Um, we also have a wiki uh, that has actually good amount of documentation uh, to get you started. So if you're a framework writer or you want to understand what can be done in a framework, this document, those documents are going to be useful. Uh, we have talked to a few people uh, as a preview to, to get uh, uh, some feedback on how we think Fenzo could be useful for other frameworks. And uh, we, we believe that it, it can be used by almost any framework that would like to do scheduling optimizations. Uh, whether it's in a cloud or in a data center, it's still useful. Um, so what are we going to do next? So we're going to start looking at SLAs. Right now, we are looking at tasks uh, without any priorities among them, especially since we're in a cloud. If, if you don't have resources, well, no need to preempt anybody. Just spin up more resources, right? But SLAs are interesting, especially when we mix in batch jobs. Uh, the way people run batch jobs is that, hey, here's my batch of 5,000 tasks. It's not like every one of those 5,000 tasks need to run right now. They just need to finish in five days. But I'm going to submit my entire batch as one job. Uh, so in times like those, it, it's good to have um, some concept of limits or quotas to say, here's my batch, but it's OK to limit me to only run so many tasks at a time. Because in five days, they are going to finish, even if you limit me to, say, 100 instead of 5,000. So those are interesting. And those are also interesting because when um, an application runs out of quota, we stop scaling up. So combining them is interesting. Uh, we are going to look at also preemptions. Uh, preemptions are interesting because, again, when you've got production run versus development or builds and testing going on, uh, it's useful for us to preempt instead of always having to scale up when uh, the costs don't justify scaling up necessarily for every test that is being run right now. Uh, we are also looking at supporting some of the newer Mesos features, especially the revocable offers. Uh, 
from uh, oversubscription. Uh, they're not available in Fenzo right now, but we're going to be adding that. And then also, very importantly, we are open to collaboration. We would love to see who else um, can benefit from Fenza. What are the use cases you're seeing that you may directly benefit from it, but maybe you have use cases that we haven't thought of um, that, that we could collaborate on. One of the important things for a scheduling library is to keep it as simple as possible. The problem itself is hard to solve. The library should be simple to use. And we've tried to add only um, features that are absolutely needed. Um, so Fenzo does not want to become another framework. It is definitely not going to be a framework by itself. It is going to be a pure core scheduling library for all the frameworks. So we're definitely not going to add anything that competes with being a framework and things like that. So with that said, to summarize, Fenzo can be very useful to any framework to do a lot of um, scheduling optimizations as well as auto-scaling the cluster, and it is now available. So with that, I would like to open up for questions. Sorry, I heard somewhere. Yes. So have we considered um, letting jobs run under uh, uh, by under-provisioning them? So that is an interesting question. I, I think it um, spans areas beyond Fenzo as well. So for example, it is easy to do that with CPUs. I could make a task ask for one CPU, but actually run eight threads. And that sort of works okay because the way CPU isolation works, at least using C groups, is that it will be uh, given a, a total effective value worth of one CPU second every second. So that would work. For memory, it's not going to work though. The way C groups are being used right now, when you hit that memory, you're Are we considering uh, some of the persistent features? Persistence features. So um, I think we're going to look at it from the perspective of assigning resources. And uh, that is coming in. So we are looking at it. And we will support what's needed in scheduling library for that. Uh, but are we using that or going to use that as soon as it comes out at Netflix? I'm not aware of a use case for that right now. Thanks. Yes. So the question is, are we seeing um, when we have multiple constraints or multiple aspects to accomplish in scheduling that sometimes some of those combinations take too long? So far we have not, but that is a concern, which is why every time we come up with new calculate, new fitness calculators or new constraints, we can easily test them. Um, so that, that definitely is an important concern. That's actually a very good point. Uh, so so the, the, the point was that, um, so the constraints are going to be sort of a, a list of constraints that the frameworks expose to the users versus users writing their own constraints. U users can easily shoot themselves in the foot writing bad constraints, absolutely. So Fenzo is written for framework developers. So Fenzo is going to be completely plugins based. You can write any constraint you want. It's the frameworks that choose what they expose to the users and different frameworks would like to expose differently. So, yeah. Yes. Are you doing any sort of oversubscribing? It was mentioned today. 
You're talking about the old subscription feature yeah, that was introduced recently? So you get the efficiency and right, right. So we're not doing old subscription right now. Uh, old subscription is very interesting when you've got um, jobs that are always running but not using all of their allocated resources. Well, that's not enough. The other part of the equation is that you need to have tasks that are willing to be preempted at any time. So uh, I sometimes call them idle soak. That is, you're, you're soaking up all the idle cycles. If you've got such a workload, I think it makes great sense. Uh, we, we don't have that right now. In fact, that's one of the features we want to add in Fenzo as well. So Fenzo can take those irrevocable offers and, and assign them differently than the regular offers. So that is something we don't have, but are willing to add into that. Yes. So are we looking at preemptions to come up with recommendations on, hey, you can kill this task and then do something better? Uh, no, we're looking at doing preemptions based on uh, strategies that uh, the frameworks put into Fenzo. So it, it's, for example, I've got 100 hosts. All of them are busy. I can't run anything else right now, but you put in another task. Where do you want to run it? So we're going to preempt. So Fenzo is not going to talk to Mesos to kill any task, right? Fenzo is just a core scheduling library. It is going to come up with the task assignment result, some of which will say this is a preemption result versus assignment result. And then the framework will actually carry out those assignments. Yeah, and, and preemptions is interesting because it turns out preemptions are far more expensive than the actual resource assignment itself. And a lot of times, you, you have a choice of preempting a task from multiple hosts. I can preempt it from this host versus that host to fit a new task. Which one do I pick? And that is where we are going to put in customization. There is no one rule that fits every environment. Sometimes you want to preempt based on how new the task is. Sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes it's based on priorities. Sometimes it's based on something else. So we're going to have, again, plugins there. I'm speculating here. We don't have that feature in Fenzo. But that would be the same strategy that we have right now. Make it plugin space to come up with which one to preempt among the choices you've got. So other questions? Yes. So the um, Fenzo, how does it? Uh, Um, so, how do we add new hosts into the cluster? Um, so, Fenzo again is providing the core logic, not the mechanisms to actually add it. So, for example, the way we achieve that is we have a callback from Fenzo coming in, hey, add 10 hosts. And then in that, we have a small piece of code that basically talks to the EC2 API um, to add 10 hosts into the cluster. That's how we do that. And then how does that get registered back with Fenzo's? So now Fenzo's Oh, I see. So, so the AMIs we deploy in um, Amazon, they already have the uh, Mesos built in. So when that starts up, the agent, the new slave, um, agent comes up and registers. Yeah. How about upgrades? Do you, um, do you upgrade all your Right, so upgrades are not as simple. Um, there are two, two different aspects of upgrades. One is upgrading our own software that's running on them and upgrading the Mesos version itself. Upgrading Mesos version, we just bring up a new cluster uh, with the new Mesos version and we have a way to slowly migrate all the tasks onto them. So that's how we do it. And same thing happens when we upgrade our own software as well. We bring up the new cluster, all the jobs are still running in the old cluster, and we migrate them in an organized fashion. Um, it's easier to do that in a cloud, obviously, because you can just spin up another ASG. In a data center, it would be a little bit different. Right. Other questions? Yes.
That's right. So, so if we don't talk, if Fenzo doesn't talk to Mesos, how does it know what the state is? Because state is required in order to bin packing or other optimization. So uh, the way it works is that when assignment results are given to the framework, if the framework chooses to launch the task, the framework also t tells Fenzo this task was launched on this host. And Fenzo maintains the entire cluster state in memory. No persistence, just in memory. And it makes the relevant state available to all the plugins. So if you're writing a plugin and if you want to write a sophisticated constraint that's based on aspects of tasks that are running, aspects of hosts, or based on even time, you can write all of the sophisticated plugins because it makes that state available to you. So if, if there are multiple frameworks, the whole game changes. The biggest aspect is a framework does not know what's the total resources on a host because Mesos may not have given an offer with the entire resources. So that is a limitation today. Um, we will have to talk to Mesos, uh, I mean not in the code, I mean talk to the people at Mesos and then see how can we change that? Perhaps there is a way to understand the entire machine configuration, even though we may not get all the resources offers for it. Uh, that helps us bin packing. Another way is, I mean, this is sort of hacking your way through. You can set an attribute onto the uh, Mesos slave daemon. If this, these are in your control, that sort of tells you what's the total configuration so, and then you can sort of put that into your uh, Fenzo fitness calculator to be aware of, based on this attribute, custom attribute that the slave sends in, I know this is an eight CPU machine, even though I've got only a four CPU offer. So you can hack your way through until we have something more concrete from Mesos itself. Well, thank you all so much. I will be available if you've got more uh, questions. We can talk offline. Thank you.